Warning, today's episode is sick. It's not really sick like that other episode was, though. It's just kind of gross. It's unsettling and upsetting. Parental guidance is suggested, even if you're 50. Get your dad to come to your house. Go pick him up from the rest home. There's something undeniably creepy about you, Big Anklevich. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Just when I think you couldn't possibly be any dumber, you go and do something like this. And Rish Outfield. <laughs> Man, you are one pathetic loser. <laughs> no offense. Sit, Ubu, sit. <laughs> Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 104. I am your host, Rish Outfield. And I am Big Anklevich. Thanks for joining us once again. We got a great story for you today. Although, be forewarned, folks, today's episode is a little unsettling and upsetting. Anything that has the word set in it table setting so if you're squeamish look away <laughs> not if you're listening to this in the car though don't don't look away right yeah keep your eyes on the road today's story is called whelp by damon no, shaw not whelp whelp oh today's story is whelp by damon shaw about the author Damon Shaw lives in the Canary Isles off the coast of Africa. He trained as an actor, then slid sideways into directing theater and designing and making puppets, with occasional stints as an actor puppeteer. He now designs and makes wooden creations and sells them to the endless stream of passing tourists, taking time to write short fiction whenever possible. He has been published in Flash Fiction Online, and A.E., the Canadian Science Fiction Review, and has work forthcoming in Daily Science Fiction, Bull Spec, the Anywhere But Earth Anthology from Cor de Lyon Publications, and The Dark Side of the Cape from Leth Press. Follow his blog at damonshaw.livejournal.com. Today's story was produced by Scott James Pig, who did an excellent job, so get ready for a treat, folks. And you can check out links to everything in the show notes. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Welp by Damon Shaw. We get pretty anxious, so we protect ourselves with defense mechanisms like repression. Narrated by Rish Outfield. All defenses reduce or redirect the anxiety by distorting or denying reality. All defenses are a form of denial, which is the unconscious refusal to accept reality. Big Anklevich as Ivan. Projection is when people disguise their own threatening impulses by pinning them on other people. Eloise Mood, voiced by Julie Hoverson of 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Rationalization is when you justify your actions and cover up the real unconscious reason. Edited by Scott Pig. Displacement is when you take your anger or some other unacceptable feeling or impulse and divert it from its source to something or someone else. For example, a man who is angry at his boss may come home and kick his dog. Music from Incompetech.com and Jamendo.com. He swung his car through the gates, feeling the tarmac change to shifting gravel under his tires. His heart kicked when he saw Eloise Mude waited for him just off the driveway. Fear and desire 
a heady mix. Without returning his smile, she gestured him to park near a newly built white building. He locked the car, trying to appear less nervous than he felt. Eloise wore a dark blue suit, smart and slim fitting. She held up a large brown envelope like a shield and didn't take his hand or let him kiss her cheek. Follow me, Ivan. She said, unlocking a black door set into the whitewashed wall. He raised one eyebrow and didn't move. The last time they met, she had clutched him to her, bruising his lips on hers while portraits stared from the walls and her husband gasped for breath somewhere nearby. This is formal. Why did you call me here, Eloise? She reached into the envelope and pulled out a glossy 10 by 8 photograph. Ivan saw light trembling off the image, as if her hands shook in the shadows. There are more, she said. Do come in, Ivan. It's in your own best interests. I have a client at five, he said. He checked his watch. 3.15. Standing on the pristine lawns of the Mewed estate, sunshine glinting from the distant geometric slants of their modern mansion, Ivan shivered. This white-washed building had no windows at all. He suspected he should get in his car and drive away. What do they show? He asked, though he feared he already knew. She didn't reply. When the silence stretched too long, Ivan bowed his head and passed through the doorway, chilled air sliding around his collar with the gentlest of touches. Eloise closed the door behind him. When his eyes adjusted after the rich sunlight, he saw a monochrome white hallway, and nearby, the antiseptic gleam of two wheeled metal trolleys. The air smelt of new paint and floral disinfectant, masking a darker odor underneath, musky and cloying. Here. Yeah. Eloise handed him the envelope and set off down the hallway. Keep up. The photos were of them, of him. White buttocks flailing. Back twisted, eyes rolled back. Why? He asked. Why photograph me? They didn't. She said without slowing. Come on, Ivan. James is famous. Outside this building, I'm public property. She turned, took the pictures from his limp grasp, and pushed them back into the envelope, before shouldering open two double doors and stalking on. What... what do they want? He asked, his mouth dry, his mind whirling with the thoughts of his wife, of Eloise's husband, of the scandal of his own bank balance. He fielded the swinging doors and pushed through, finding himself in a large, dim room, stuffy and warm. Chest-high partitions left a clear aisle between spacious enclosures. Eloise waited under the strip lights. A stench hit him as he caught up with her. Almost caramel, almost bread dough, the animal musk of puppies caught in his throat. Eloise, how much do they want? They? Eloise paused, her hand on her hips. Oh, Ivan, you misunderstand. The photographs are mine. Yours? Ivan glanced over a partition and into the wet face of a St. Bernard. A tumor the size of a melon hung from the side of the dog's head, pulling its mouth into a nightmare snarl. It wagged its tail, and a thread of drool spilled from its distorted mouth. Christ! Ivan stumbled back and almost fell. Hand over his mouth, he swallowed until he could speak. What's going on, Eloise? Eloise didn't even glance at the animal. I have the originals, she said, tucking the envelope into her jacket. They weren't expensive to buy. No one cares much. He shook his head. His wife would care. A lot. But Eloise... He said, knowing he sounded like a child. Are you blackmailing me? She laughed. I would say blackmail was an ugly word, if I hadn't been so happy to pay off the photographer myself. She leaned back against a partition and crossed her arms. Yes, Ivan. I have something I want you to do before I hand them over. Somewhere, a dog whimpered. Ivan's hands shook, and he realized it was rage he felt. Eloise's manipulation shocked him with its bluntness. It made him want to slap her face, and this violence in him shook him even more. What do you want me to do? He asked through gritted teeth. 
she faced down his anger with a steady gaze. James is still very ill. So? The statement made no sense. Her husband had been on the news just that morning, rehearsing the premiere of his latest opera. His masterpiece, they said. He looked fit and healthy, despite having been ravaged by cancers only a year ago. What does that have to do with me? Listen, she said, and I'll tell you. Ivan turned away, closed his eyes, and breathed through his nose. He needed to stay calm, to watch Eloise and learn what he could. He should be able to read her body language. He was a psychiatrist, for God's sake. Lowering his hands, refusing to look to either side, he leaned against the opposite partition and consciously mimicked her stance. Okay, tell me, he said, and was gratified that his voice hardly wavered at all. Eloise nodded, her face blank. James had been given a week to live the night we met, you and I, she said. He was ill for a lot longer than that before, of course. Ivan pretended he was in his counseling room and let her take her time. She seemed cool, but her ankles were crossed, as well as her arms, and he wondered if she was holding secrets in or warding them off. Either way, it was a polished, high-status defense. She was unstoppable. He remembered that now. They had met at a hushed private recital of Cerberus Unbound, a choral work by her husband. James Mewed himself trembled between life and death, trapped inside an oxygen tent in an adjacent wing of their angular Ernst Lore mansion. Ivan had sponsored enough art events to swing an invite, but not enough to merit a good seat. He had to sit down when he realized she was flirting with him in the emptying hall. His knees went weak, like a foal. He took the offered canopy, licked the proffered fingertip, helped her tidy away the music stands as staff cleared the chairs and dimmed the dandelion chandeliers. There hadn't been the slightest doubt he would say yes. A dog yelped nearby. Eloise ignored I it. I needed someone that night, and you were there. I thought that would be the end of it. Her gaze lifted to the far wall, but didn't soften. Shortly after, we thought it was James's last night. He wanted the oxygen tank open, even though we knew it would kill him, and... She took a ragged breath. All that genius inside him would die, too. Ivan watched her talk. Faint spots of color lit her cheekbones. She might have been drinking, he thought. Somewhere behind her, a dog whimpered quietly. We opened the oxygen tent, and our cat slipped inside and onto James's bed. I remember thinking, oh, to hell with hygiene. Just look at his face. He was smiling so clear. And then I didn't want him to go. The thought of living without that smile was unbearable. And I saw the cat in his arms, and I prayed to the light and to the dark that the cat be taken and not James. She cleared her throat. And in the morning, the cat was dead. And James was still alive. Okay, Ivan said slowly. And you think... He still had cancer, of course. Eloise pushed herself upright and brushed the back of her skirt. Skin cancer, tumors in his liver, marrow, brain. She said, walking down the aisle between the pens. He was riddled. But his lungs were clear. The dead cat dripped blood from its nose. It didn't put me off, though. We had other pets, and I took them one by one. She spoke so matter-of-factly that Ivan felt the hairs rise on his arms. He followed her despite himself. What did you do? He asked. I put my right hand on his arm and my left on the animal, and I felt the illness pass through me. She couldn't hide a shiver, but her voice stayed steady. A few days later, I buried the bodies. Hector, the bloodhound, went quite blind before the end. Held for three hours straight. That hurt, I can tell you. She reached the far wall, turned, and lifted her chin. But the world needs James alive. I'm sure you'll agree. Ivan shook his head very slightly, but managed no answer. Eloise peered at him, as if trying to read his response then gestured over the floor with a wave. Anyway, I get them from rescue centers now. Jim is still a very sick man. There was a long pause. 
Are you saying these animals... Ivan couldn't finish. He should be dead. His body is trying to kill him. Every day they discover a new cancer, a new illness. His body fights itself, and from that struggle comes his genius. Ivan couldn't hold back a snort of derision. (laughs) Eloise's eyes blazed. While I can, I will keep him alive. He held up one hand, but did not look away. You believe you can transfer the symptoms from your ill husband to household pets? He said. On any other occasion, I'd suggest you make an appointment. Right now, all I want to know is what I have to do to get the photographs. She gave him a sharp glance, opened her mouth, then looked away again before speaking. Take care of a dog. A sick dog. He grunted and looked around the pens. Which? I don't keep her in here. The other dogs become... distressed. Percy, she's called. A greyhound bitch passed her racing prime, but ripe for breeding. I used to let her sleep under my bed. She took a deep breath. (sighs) She won't die, and I can't kill her. Ivan clenched his fists. And what do you want me to do with her? Eloise took a step towards him, leaned close, and gripped his elbow. Make sure she feels no pain, she said. He smelled the alcohol on her, sharp under the perfume, and felt a wave of terrifying lust rise to war with the fury. Before he could kiss her or yell or walk away, she blinked, dropped his arm, and was gone. Percy's through here. She tapped on a plain white door. I parked you near the service entrance. I'll have to go round outside and unlock it. Anger flickered red at the edges of his vision. You parked me? She crossed her arms and stood her ground. Take Percy, and the photographs are yours. I have your wife's work address. Ha! Ivan pointed his finger like a sword. And tell the world that you fucked around too? I don't think so. She shook her head. Don't be foolish. I have been digitally removed. She produced a silver key. When he wouldn't take it, she stuck it in the keyhole of the door. I'll meet you outside. His impotence burned in his cheeks, but he let her push past him. At the double doors, she paused. Don't hang around, Ivan. James will be back soon. He looked at the key protruding from the lock. Eloise's footsteps faded, and the outside door closed very far away. He licked his lips. The door was simple, white plastic and aluminum, with no handle. A slatted grill at eye level revealed nothing beyond but blackness. Ivan reached for the key, then paused. A dog whined a few pens away. She won't die, Eloise had said, and I can't kill her. He looked with flinching glances into the nearest enclosures and saw limp bodies, milky white eyes, emaciated rib cages almost unmoving. He stopped when he saw a bald, black-and-white terrier, its cracked skin speckled with sores. Whatever Eloise had behind the door, it would be worse than these. In the end, cowardice drove him to take hold of the key. The look of disappointment on his wife's face scared him more than any cancerous canine. He had seen sick animals before. He had spent years on a farm as a kid. He would take the dog, get the photos, and if he was lucky, he'd think of a parting shot to give him some kind of satisfaction as he drove away. You're fucking insane. Didn't sound good coming from a therapist, but it might have to do. With a complex click, the key turned, and the door swung open. A wall of warm air rolled over him, and Ivan immediately felt sweat prickle his forehead. At least it didn't smell of dogs just of coal and smoke. In the darkness, a rectangular outline of light five yards away showed the sun on the other side of one more door. To the right, dull brown flames danced behind smoky glass. The woman had built an incinerator on her estate. Ivan hugged his arms, unwilling to venture into the gloom. This was a crematorium, only one door away from a cancer ward. Saliva flooded his mouth, and he swallowed it back, willing the nausea to fade. Whatever was really happening here, it must surely be illegal, but he doubted it proved much of a worry to Eloise. 
She believed she performed interspecies tumor transplants at will. Perhaps she was being conned, or her husband was involved himself somehow in a convoluted plot to drive her mad. Ivan shook his head. It didn't matter. He groped around the edges of the door, hoping to find a switch. But by then, his eyes had adjusted, and he knew where the dog lay. The same chest-high partition enclosed a corner of the furnace room. In the darkness, something shifted and groaned. The sound shivered through him, and the hairs rose on his arms. Footsteps on gravel were followed by a sharp clang. The service door rattled and rolled up into the roof, letting in floods of dazzling sunshine. Shielding his eyes, Ivan saw his car glinting on the gravel nearby and felt such a strong urge to bolt for it, he had to force himself not to run. Eloise stepped, a black silhouette, into the doorway and hung a padlock on the inside of the door. I'll open the back, she said, holding out one hand. The keys, ma'am? Oh. Ivan fished out his car keys and threw them over. They hit her in the chest and fell to the floor. While she swore and stooped, Ivan shook his head, rolled up his mental shirt sleeves, strode to the corner, and looked over the wall. At first he couldn't make out what he saw. Something large, dun-colored, tight like a drum, but ridged and boned. Then he saw a wagging tail, folded, stick-like legs, a corded neck, and pointed ears. A greyhound. She lay on her side, her body distorted in an obscene parody of pregnancy. Ivan couldn't imagine what internal wreckage could cause such swelling. It lifted her legs so that they hung, trembling from the taut globe of her body. The dog looked up from the floor. Her eye legs could take her weight. If you had this power, what would you do? Ivan glanced at the doorway. Eloise stood, half in sunlight, half in shadow. What? No idea. He turned away and slid the bolt to open the pen. Does she bite? Persephone? Never. The light dimmed. Ivan looked up to see Eloise unscrew the top of a hip flask. Like a shot? She asked. I'm driving, he said. He stepped into the pen and knelt, reaching out the back of his hand to the animal's nose. She sniffed, then laid her head down with a soft sigh. Ivan pushed two empty bowls to one side and scooped up the trembling body, feeling his back strain for weight. Close up, the dog smelled surprisingly sweet, like hay or mown grass. She twitched in his arms with a feverish internal energy. Her heat burned through his shirt. He straightened, supporting her head in the crook of one elbow. Would you use it on yourself? Ivan frowned. Eloise stared into his face, apparently unaware she blocked the doorway. He had to step around her, push through the narrow gap, and out into the light. Would you use it on yourself? Eloise called. She didn't follow him to the car. He ignored her and laid Percy down in the back. The dog looked as if she would roll with every turn. Ivan would have to brave the furnace room again for blankets to tuck around her body. He was saved passing through the doorway. Eloise held out some faded tartan blankets, but wouldn't let go of them until he answered her question. Would I cure myself at the expense of some innocent animal? Ivan snorted. (laughs) Probably not, he said, and leaned forward. I'd find more deserving victims for my cancers. My car keys, please. And if it wasn't just cancers? Oh, Eloise, give me the blankets and my keys and the photos, too. And let me get the hell out of here. We weren't careful enough, Ivan, you and me. Eloise stepped back into the shadows. I got pregnant. Her statement didn't make sense. Or rather, it did, but not in this conversation. You what? I didn't mean to do it. For the first time, she sounded lost. I panicked. I didn't want James to find out. (laughs) Ivan heard a grunt from his car, glanced over, and felt a chill spear through him in spite of the sunlight. Are you saying you... that that dog is... Abruptly, he was furious. Give me the blankets! He shouted, unwilling, even in his anger, to step through the door. She spoke from the darkness. I was only a few weeks late. Percy was pregnant, too. She's overdue for a dog. She placed the envelope and his keys on top of the blankets, stepped forward, and handed them over. 
take care of her, Ivan. I can't do it myself. She tapped the envelope, looking tired. There are no originals. These are the only copies. Ivan took the bundle and walked away, afraid that he would lose his temper completely if he heard much more. She needed help, not a screaming match. He threw the photos into the front of the car and tucked the blankets around Percy, letting her lick his hand before he shut the back doors. He straightened. I'm going to think about what I can do to shut this place down. Eloise shrugged. Behind her, brown flames licked against smoky glass. I don't know what you are doing in there, but I'll tell you this. He turned away, shouting back over his shoulder, feeling each word swell louder than the last. You, Eloise Mude, are fucking insane. He found a side road and parked within minutes of leaving the estate. His hands shook too much to steer. The dog wagged her tail whenever he looked over his shoulder, but made no noise. He stared, unseeing out of the windshield, trying to imagine the hell that Eloise must have gone through. The stress of nearly losing James must have shaken her hard. If she had indeed fallen pregnant, just as James began to recover... Ivan could see how it might give rise to such a consistent delusion, especially if she miscarried. The dark fantasy had blossomed, and Eloise, unfortunately, had the money to give it rich and fertile soil. Ivan leaned his head on the cool glass of the side window. Did James Mude know his wife had stepped through some doorway into a very foreign land? He shuddered and swallowed until he was calmer, and at last switched on his mobile and searched for a local vet. Obviously, there were none in this area, just rambling suburban mansions, but Ivan found several closer to his office. He was about to call the nearest when he heard a low groan from behind him, and turning, saw the dog, hind legs open wide, twitch and strain, muscles cording in her neck. To his horror, a dark red balloon pushed from under her tail and then burst with a gush of rosy liquid over the back of his car. Christ! He flipped the phone shut. The dog whimpered and tried to curl around to sniff between her back legs, but her distorted belly left her stranded, unable to move. A heavy, iron-rich smell filled the car. Ivan wound down the windows and breathed through his mouth. Part of Eloise's story was true. Persephone was giving birth. Slipping the car into gear, he eased out into the road. The closest vet was only five blocks from his office. If he could get the dog there before she popped, he could dump her on them and get back in time for his client. He still had over an hour. A white transit van pulled out in front of him, and Ivan braked sharply. Shit. Sorry, girl. Behind him, the dog whined. Ivan glanced round, swerved, and heard a horn off to his left. He saw only the shuddering bulk of her belly before he flicked his eyes back to the road ahead. That couldn't all be puppies. The dog must be ill, too. As he wound into town, the rush hour traffic grew heavier. Four streets from his office, the nearest vet blocked by a snarl of cars and roadworks. The dog yelped, and something small and dark slipped and fell out of sight behind the blankets. Ivan pumped the accelerator and hit the horn, but it took him another ten minutes just to reach the parking spot outside his office. Screw it, he said, swinging the car to the right, up the ramp, and stopping with a jerk. How'd you get? He knew how much blood spilled with even normal births. Hopefully the blankets had soaked up a lot of it, but he still had a hell of a cleaning job before his wife next used the car. He had imagined the dog might be aggressive, pupping with a stranger, but she licked his hand again and let him roll her bulk to one side. A dead puppy lay underneath her. Normally born blind, this had a lot of fur, claws and teeth, and wide open eyes. It seemed overdeveloped, as if it had grown inside too long. Stay. He wrapped the still form in the wettest blanket and ran to a rubbish bin just off the street. When he returned, he paused, looking at her. He could dump her in a skip or leave her in a park or something. But after his high moral stance with Eloise, he would feel too guilty. A thin trickle of liquid ran from her hindquarters. One thing was clear. She couldn't stay in the car. 
He had a rug in his waiting room. The floor was parquet, too. Easy to clean. He looked at his watch. Mr. Jefferson was due at five. Ivan made a decision he had never done in his life. He canceled a client. Terribly sorry, uh, family emergency. Yes, I am stressed. Need a therapist, yes. I'll reimburse you. Call me Monday. Bye. The dog looked up at him with liquid eyes. She seemed calmer than he felt. He wasn't fit to give therapy this afternoon. He pulled the blanket up around her and hoisted her out of the car. She whined then, a high-pitched noise, only just audible. By the second flight of stairs, Ivan's thighs burned. The blanket slipped inch by inch through his grip. The dog struggled weakly, heaving her higher, breathing deep and forcing himself step by step. He finally reached his waiting room door. The rug was deep and comfortable, and hopefully absorbent. He folded it and pushed it into a corner, behind the comfy armchairs, and poured a cup of Evian, which Percy drank noisily. By then, a new wave of contractions had begun, clearly visible beneath her short fur. This time, she seemed in more pain. Her whine turned into a yelp, and she snapped at his hand when he tried to calm her. He maneuvered himself to get a clearer view and saw, protruding from her body, three pink bumps, which resolved to be the snout and two front paws of another dead puppy, expelled in a rush of blood and mucus. Ivan took off his jacket and slung it over a chair. He wrapped the body in paper towels, again noting its broad head and solid build. Before he'd disposed of it in the waste bin, Percy yelped again and then howled. The note started low, but shivered up into a pure high wail. The sound burred in Ivan's chest, kicking his heart up a gear, raising the hairs on his neck. More than pain echoed in that howl. Fear rang there, too. A clenched ripple squeezed from Percy's shoulders to her hips. Her howl rose sharply, then cut off as she relaxed, panting in hoarse gasps. She ignored Ivan's hand, didn't even raise her head. She only had time for a few rasping breaths before she was racked by another contraction, and again she howled. There, girl, there. The sound of her pain filled him with impotent panic. Ivan ran to lock his waiting room door, as if that would reduce the sound. When he returned, Percy's eyes rolled back in her head, and streaks of blood darkened her back legs. Ivan knelt to peer between her back legs, and his heart stopped in terror. Hands twitched there. Furred hands, tucked under a pink snout, tipped with human nostrils, but long, far too long. The greyhound's body clenched around this muzzle, and the tiny hands beneath jerked and clenched. Each hairy finger was tipped by a perfect crescent fingernail. Ivan yelled. He stood, fell back over a chair, stumbled, and ran for his consulting room, still yelling. He slammed the door behind him, scrabbled for a filing cabinet, and tried to pull it across the door, but gave up and backed away, hands over his face. Beyond the door, the dog screamed. The sound splintered into several notes before cutting short. Something thumped against the parquet, and then there was a silence more terrifying than any noise. It did not last. Ivan heard his mobile phone, still in his jacket pocket in the waiting room, begin to ring. He shook his head, unable to move any further back. The windowsill pushed against his thighs. A shaft of dusty sunlight crossed the consulting room, tinted orange by layers of city smog. It must be nearing five by now. Ivan twisted and opened the window. The breeze ruffled his hair. Three stories below him, his car was already in shadow. He could see the square of the brown envelope on the dashboard. There was no way he could climb down. At the window, he cast a shadow across the floor and up the door to his waiting room. Ivan crept across the parquet, listening hard. He thought he heard quiet panting and a creaking noise that might have been the wind or something moving on the floor. 
He bent and peered through the keyhole, but saw nothing. As he pulled away, he caught a scent, faint but growing stronger. Almost caramel, almost bread dough. The smell of puppies crept through the keyhole and coated the back of his throat with dread. A sound grew, a repeated, soft, wet sound that Ivan knew was Percy licking something again and again, only six feet away in a foreign land, strange and dark. He reached a trembling hand to the doorknob, but let it fall. On the other side of his waiting room, down the stairs and past the mail slots and entry phones, the sky slipped into a blue shadowed dusk. Ivan knew that this was one door he could never open, even as the orange shaft of sunlight crept towards red, finally faded, and the long night began. And now, a word about today's story. I wrote this rather nasty story when my partner was suspected of having cancer. I was interested in how far a character would go to save someone they loved. During this time, while I was caring for my partner, I began learning how to write, something I'm sure I wouldn't normally have the discipline to do. My partner passed away in January this year. Thanks to his support and encouragement, I am now having work accepted and published. I would like to dedicate this story, and many others, to him. All right, welcome back, everybody. Were you squeamish at all while listening to this story? Are you asking them or me? Well, I'll ask you, since they can't really respond. How about you? Oh, I was. There were a couple of moments where it was shudder-worthy. <laughs> now, I always felt like the story was really sick, really upsetting, disturbing, unsettling, table-setting, things like that. Uh-huh. But then hearing it aloud with the sound effects. <laughs> yeah, it makes you squirm as you listen. You're like, yeah. That pushed it over the edge. And Scott really did a bang up job on this with just creating a, an atmosphere with sound effects and music and, and noises and all sorts of things. You know, we've talked many times about how when we hand a story to a different producer, you know, they, they have their take of how they're going to do it. And it's perfectly fine if somebody wants to go real easy on the sound effects or get really stark with the music and then and this it sounded like you were just listening to a movie going on in the next room you know there's all sorts of ambient noise and and effects and, and things like that that uh, you would expect in an actual film right but yeah very few people i think would be willing to put in the, the hours of work it would take to create something like this for a podcast you know funny you should mention that because uh when he sent us out the final version of this story in his email he says uh here it is um i was at the same point about a week after you gave me the story then i screwed up my save file somehow and had to start over then i went over to do aid work with the army and supported japanese disaster relief so that was a couple of weeks off my time when i came back i had it nearly done again and made the same mistake with the save file so this is really the third time I have edited this thing. Jeez Louise, you're kidding. <laughs> Talk about how much work he thought he put into it. He did it three times. So everything that you think he did times three. I'm not a soothsayer, but something tells me we won't be having more episodes edited by poor Scott Pig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. That, yeah, that's the kind of thing that would swear you off ever doing it again. Yeah, you would think. It's a shame. And yeah, this is another one of those stories where he, he, despite the catastrophes, Baker, he got it to us so early that we moved it up in the schedule where, yeah. of where it was originally meant to be. It, it, it amazes me when people are super ambitious like that. I, oh, this guy had an opening title sequence and we'd never had that before. Yeah. It's so much like a film or the, you know, he's got an opening credit sequence and, uh, he had a couple of different versions of that, too, mm -hmm. in case we didn't like the weird one or, you know, didn't get the weird one like I didn't. And yeah, nobody's ever done that before. But, th but that's something that we do when we have somebody produce is, you know, how much control over this do you want to have? 
do you want Big and I to do all the voices and you can just edit it? And do you want Big to do the music and you just do the, the voices? And, or do you want to go out and cast all of your friends and do the sound effects and create the sound effects yourself and, you know, find music and, and, and edit it all together and do several passes and mix and episode art? And, you know, I mean, it's just people can be as in charge as they want to on these things. Um, and yeah, this was one where when I heard it, except for it being my voice, I, I almost didn't recognize what we had created. It just sounded so different. And and so besides the opening title sequence, this guy also had the, the, the very first sex scene <laughs> we'd had. And it was weird as it's not really in the story, but he just, do you want to describe what he asked you to do? Yeah, he had this idea where he wanted to juxtapose the sounds of... Ivan and Eloise having sex over the description of the pictures. And you hear it. He sees uh, taken. A photograph being taken. And yeah, yeah, the, the photograph snapping. And it's a more abstract take on, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing where he's giving us what he's describing in, in the story um, in a different way. I thought it was really interesting. It was a little uncomfortable to have to... Uh, breathe heavy and make moaning noises on the microphone with Rish sitting next to me. I'm pretty sure he had his head in his hands and he was just going, oh. But um, I was chanting, om nam shivai, om nam shivai, om nam shivai. <laughs> to do that. And I thought it actually turned out well. I remember Julie thinking, had to do it as well. Yeah, she did. What, what do you remember thinking? Oh, I remember thinking when he said that, I was like, oh, this is going to be a disaster. Oh, no. But yeah, it turned out well, I thought. I thought it really worked for the segment that it had. It's something that we've noticed many times where the text is put in front of us and depending on who is doing the, the reading, who is doing the voices, who is doing the editing, who is choosing the music, you can create something very different. You know, if Brian Lincoln had edited this episode or if I had edited this episode or if Renee had edited this episode, it would have sounded very different and they would have stressed different things and maybe had a, a slightly different attitude. And uh, I don't know that I would have had the sound of a melon being dropped off the Empire State <laughs> Building for when the dog gave birth. But it was I, sure I, awesome. You know, it just it reminds me when I was in college, uh, we had an acting class and we were partnered off. And a bunch of us were given the exact same scene. We had to memorize it and we had to block it. And then we had to perform it in front of the class. And everybody had the same scene. But because they had different individual tastes and takes on the material and accents and places they chose to stress and, and personalities that came through. And, and it was really fascinating, you know, when it wasn't your turn to just sit and watch. And you know, I was like, wow, I would never have read the line that way. Or, and, or other times where you're just like, oh, shoot, that's what that line means. I've been saying <laughs> it completely wrong. And things. And to me, that was really interesting. And it should have been boring because we all did the same scene, but uh, it wasn't. Right. And, and so this is something like that. Now, we, it's not like we gave it to Scott Pig and, and somebody else and heard the two versions. We're not Starship Sofa decided which one we wanted, you know, that would be a really interesting thing. You know, it's kind of similar to the whole broken mirror right. thing where now obviously with the broken mirror, you can take it in any number of directions. It's much more wide open than you actually having a text. Much more freedom to do your own thing. But you think about how many different filmed versions of A Christmas Carol there are, right. are or of Dracula or something like that, just where, you know, there are countless takes and there are constantly new fresh takes that are being made romeo and juliet something like that uh i dig that i think that's really interesting it just shows the breadth of human creativity and uh, interpretation and so uh, thank you scott and boy i feel terrible because i can't do an english accent as well as he did. no i feel terrible because he had to do the darn thing over and over and over again but I totally understand what he's talking about. We've been there right. and had to record episodes over again, had to re-edit episodes, had to, you know, things yeah. like that. Because <laughs> Back in the early days, holy crap, how many times did we say that? We would be like, hi, everybody. This is the second time we're doing this episode because we re recorded for two hours and then we went and listened to the file and it was silent. And, you know, that probably should have stopped us in our <laughs> tracks 
taken it as some kind of omen or some kind of sign that you are not to proceed. This episode is the one you were not meant to hear. Yeah, but we didn't. We forged on. I mean, it was probably another one of those where there was a three-week span in between episodes because we had to do it again. But that happens. that's human endeavor. That, that's how you learn. You make mistakes and learn what not to do. I was just talking to somebody the other day, and I can't remember what we were talking about. But I said, in the future, there's going to be a term called the George Lucas syndrome or the George Lucas factor. And it's going to essentially be when you have no obstacles and unlimited resources, your creativity goes way down. The end product goes way down in quality because we need obstacles. We need difficulty. We need to make compromises and have things that where it can't do exactly what you want. And so instead, we're going to do this. We need other people saying, well, what if I say I know instead? Or, you know, another director who chooses to focus on acting rather than the fucking special effects and things like that. And suddenly you get something that is not what you intended, but it's better. Mm -hmm. But if you have carte blanche to do exactly as you want and it's easy to get there, then some of those happy accidents, some of those amazing accomplishments never happen. Yeah. And you get vanilla or you get... Not even as good as vanilla. Vanilla's got a nice flavor to it that's really smooth and goes well with a lot of different stuff. Episode one, two, and three aren't, aren't quite that. I, I, I guess I hear you on that. <laughs> um, look, we, you need to stumble, and you need to struggle, and you need to run out of time, and you need compromise. You, you need to be able to compromise. That's something that I was never very good at, of saying, okay, well... They're not happy with what I did, so I have to come up with something else right now. And, and I know about 70 episodes ago, I talked about the one pitch session I had in front of producers in L.A., uh -huh. where I had my, I think it was three screenplays ready to pitch. And, you know, 10 seconds into the pitching of one, the guy's like, nah, next. And then two minutes later, when we'd gotten through the third screenplay that I had, he's like, all right, what else you got? It's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> I had no idea it was going to be like this. I, I, I have nothing. Too bad uh, your teacher, who, wasn't it uh, the teacher that basically set up the pitch meeting for you as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember he told a story once in class about how he went to a pitch meeting and they made up <laughs> an idea about a chimpanzee who gets struck by lightning and becomes a lawyer and sold that idea as a sitcom in the middle of the pitch session, just a similar one probably to what you came uh, up against where they were just like, nah, I don't want those. What else you got? And they're like, uh, but, uh, what about, do uh, you like animals? Maybe you should have just pitched them something like that. A monkey gets struck. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible idea too. Well, see, I watched that sitcom as a kid and he wasn't just a lawyer. He was president of the United States. Oh, sweet. We, well, you'll hear about these writers that work on a show like Monk or, 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 or The Simpsons before it went off the air or, you know, Friends or, or whatever it is. And the Saturday Night Live, they're around the table and they're pitching ideas and it's a tough room and somebody's like, nah, that doesn't work. Or, wow, we already did one like that. Or, oh, no, 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 no. Come on, you can do better than that. And you're just like, oh, what is it? And, and inspiration strikes or there's some kind of contagious creative spark where somebody's like yeah oh and then and then this and he's like oh, oh and two or three guys get the exact same idea at the same time and it's just like oh it's just it's magic and i i wish i could be in a room like that professionally you know that be my job but at the same time i guess that could burn somebody out you could really yeah. Difficult. yeah collaborating is hard to do too i mean we just finished a, a collaboration not too long ago and uh, it was kind of like that though i mean me and you had no ideas for the story and uh, we got together and started bouncing them off of each other and by the time we were done you said you're like oh i finally know what it's like to have a good idea i guess two heads can really be better than one well it's it's kind of like the show house how they've got the most brilliant diagnostician, <laughs> sorry, doctor, on the face of the earth who can diagnose any problem and intuitively know what it is, but he needs 
other minds in the room to give him ideas, stepping stones so that he can get to what the answer is. And every time, you know, he'll just bite somebody's head off for a stupid idea or whatever. But if it weren't for that stupid idea or the, the fifth that idea after that, you'd never get to that moment of, oh, okay, this is what it is. And that's what maybe everybody needs. I, I know I personally need that a lot of times, somebody to bounce ideas off of to come up with things that are in my imagination or in my head or they spring from my brain, but I never would have come up with them if it hadn't been for that conversation with you. Mm -hmm. It was so weird how I had tried four or five interpretations of the, the subject, the, the, the premise that we were supposed to go off of and none of them worked, but I get you on the phone and suddenly it's like, well, but what about this? And this and this and this and this and the ideas start to to multiply like a fungus or a tribbles or, or a married woman's ass. And, and you're just like, holy cow, I, I created a story. It felt like it was writing itself at some point there where I knew where it was going to go and all that stuff. Never would have happened had we not been having that conversation. So maybe I need to do more collaboration. Maybe I need to be in more rooms like that. Uh, the good thing about Scott's whole ordeal is uh, I, I said, you know, if that happened to you three times when I wrote him back after he sent me that email, I'm like, you need to figure out what the heck that mistake was that you made with your save file so this doesn't happen to you again. And he said he's got that figured out and he knows what the mistake was and he's figured out a way to work around it so that it won't happen to him again. So he's learned from his mistake and that's uh, kind of the point, I guess. Maybe he'll still be willing to uh, come back and do another one for us since he figured that out. Well, if so, I, I'm excited. I, I can't wait to hear where he goes with it. it you know, it's something that we were ha we had our little walk. Little walk. How, how many miles is it? My foot hurts like you wouldn't believe. Uh, we had our walk You should before. try using both feet next time on the walk. It makes it a little easier. Yeah, well. And it's also kind of annoying to walk next to you when you do that. All right. But we had our walk, and during the walk, we were talking about episode art for an upcoming episode, and how could you do this, and what might this work, and and you know what? Any one of these images might work for an episode art, and it just you know just depends on who does it, or somebody wants to do a drawing, or I do a drawing, or somebody wants to do something with Photoshop, or you know what I mean? Take a photograph and just use the photograph, and we've done all of these things for episode art. Mm -hmm. And, and everything, you know, the creative expression is like that. And just depending on how much time you have or how much work you want to put into it or, or what you feel like the focus should be on for that particular episode, you told me somebody else has already created art for it. And you described it to me and I was just like, is that even in the story? It was just like some <laughs> image that jumped out to a particular person that to me, that's not what the story is about at all. But to him, it is. And, you know, it's just that's, that's one thing that's really fun about farming out these projects to other people is, is they have their own creativity and they have their own barometer of, of where it should go and how sick is too sick or how, <laughs> you know, how the pace should go, you know, how the, the music should create things or, or the, the absence of music. To me, that's really, really interesting. It's a shame that we edit our own incentive episodes because <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to farm out one of my stories to this guy. Yeah, speaking of how sick is too sick, what did you think of this story? It was uh, it was a fairly sick story. I mean, uh, this is a pretty twisted idea that uh, goes behind this uh, this story, and and it was carried out, and then oh, it was an extra sick. I mean, it wasn't gross out sick, although sometimes it almost seemed like it. I, I can imagine that there is a portion of our audience that would turn it off, that would, wouldn't be able to listen to them. And I don't know what Damon's mindset – well, we know what the impetus was. But, right. but I don't know his mindset for writing the story. But I hope he wouldn't be hurt by that. He'd be like, sure, sure you turned it off. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, if, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable as hell. And if it didn't, right. then I didn't do my job. Yeah, just what a twisted, effed up idea <laughs> of the whole transferring of the cancer to the animals and, and transferring the... The pregnancy the, by accident. Crap, that's effed up. <laughs> I don't know if you jumped on this story the second you read it and was like, oh, yes, definitely. But I know that Sudden Death Nicole, our submissions editor, sent it to us, you and me, after it had gone through the Oompa Loompa shoot and... 
I think she put a little disclaimer of, you know, I don't know if this is for you kind of thing. And I read it and I, I liked it, but I had that same thought. It's like, well, if Big says no, well, we won't take it because I can see this being a deal breaker for some people. You'll listen to a certain podcast, maybe Drabblecast, for example, and they tend to play a certain t- type of story. I'm not going to say that, you know, every episode's the same or whatever, but they, they play strange stories for strange listeners or whatever. And every once in a while, you'll hear a story on Drabblecast and go, is that a Drabblecast story? <laughs> and I don't know if we have our own niche because, you know, we'll do sci-fi, we'll do horror, we'll do right. fantasy and occasionally the Western and things like that. But I don't know that there's any other story like this that we've done. This, If we have a niche, then this one's outside the niche. <laughs> well, we've done some some creepy horror stories in the past. We've done some stories that are meant to creep people out and right, stories that this, are meant to scare people. This horrifies rather than, <laughs> than scares. yeah. My criteria for uh, stories that we pick has always been basically that you read it and it's a good story. It keeps your interest and the whole way through you're, you're wanting to know what's going to happen next and, and, and that kind of a stuff. It's, a, it's just a fun story. It's a good story. It's something that's interesting. And it doesn't matter which genre it fits into or where it goes, if it's particularly sick. And we've done a few that are just sick. I think we even have a category we have a list of categories that stories fall into and sick was one of those lists oh, cool. and i think there's a story or two in there good although i've been less diligent in keeping those categories up to date unfortunately but uh, you could click on it and find a few stories that we figured were pretty darn sick one always comes to mind and that's uh, saul limeron's good day story which was just <laughs> twisted and sick man it was the humor in it was so dark that uh, just seemed like sick was the best word to describe it. And this story is sick, but in a different way. Uh, I don't know that there's uh, much humor in this story. It's just kind of a dark subject, and it just goes a really dark way. And it's, oh, I just really enjoyed the, the creep outedness of this story. Well, you know, tribulations, personal tragedy can put somebody in a very dark place. And art is a great way to get yourself out of that dark place or deal with the darkness. And and yeah, I would be interested in reading other stories by Damon, you know, maybe written years later or maybe written when he was at a different place and see. It's it's hard to say. It's something that, that I've mentioned countless times on the show is how you'll always kill the kid. (laughs) But you're not a a morbid person. You're not an unhappy, unpleasant person. That's me. And yet it's so hard for me to kill the kid. It's like, oh, let him go. Come on, let him live. I don't know why I'm like that, but I guess everybody has, again, the barometer. And I've got a creative yardstick and uh, it, it only goes so far of what I'm willing to do and other people, you know, it's, it's a mile long. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that maybe I need to work on, or maybe it just is how people are different. That sometimes can really be a, a thing for art. Art can be a really cathartic experience. A lot of times we're, we're able to deal with our demons and our, and our troubles and our... Our demons? <laughs> our demons, yes. We're able to deal with those things by way of taking them and transforming them into something else. You know, you, you've got this loved one that is suffering from cancer. And then you can be able to indulge in the fantasy of being able to just take that cancer and pull it out of the person that you love and put it in a dog or in a cat, or whatever animal it is that she's got from the shelter presently. (laughs) I can really understand that. Back when I was a teenager, my mother passed away from cancer, and it was a hard time for my whole family. And to be able to uh, deal with that in some other way, you got to find a way to deal with those kind of really troubling uh, times. And, you know, his author's note really touched me, how he worked on writing during this period of caring for his partner and how uh, his partner, although he was suffering, encouraged him and, and he wanted to dedicate this story and the others that were forthcoming still to him. It was, it was, I thought that was a really touching thing. I, I really am glad that we were able to have that on our show. 
I wonder if Damon is able to enjoy the story uh, on the same level as we are. That's something that you and I talk about all the time. I don't know when I've written a story that's good or not. I don't know if it's funny to somebody else or just funny to me because it's my sense of humor. I don't know if it's scary. Sure, there are certain things that scare me and I've tried to put them in this story, but is it scary to other people? Is it scary to you? I can't judge that. I'm too close to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if that might come around to bite you if you've written something like this. And, and I don't know how much of Damon is in this story, you know, if he just poured himself into it. But sometimes you can do that where it's too intimate and you're like, geez, I don't want to ever read that again. Or I don't want anybody to read that. That's one that you put away for when you pass away, <laughs> they'll open it at your, your... in your will. Right. This may only be published upon them my death. Uh, that, that was something we were talking about today. What What was that? You uh, said you had finished our final episode. I did, yeah. And I said I needed to write a clause into my will that says that the episode needs to be put on the feed That's in right. the event of my death. Well, I, I, thank you for mentioning that. That's a milestone. I finished that today. I saved that file today that we recorded months ago. I mean, it, it had been so long that I started to be surprised at the things that we said because I had no memory of us saying them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, you're in for a treat, folks, uh, momentarily when we end the podcast. We've got a final episode all ready to go. Yeah, can't wait. You've been praying for there to be a final episode of this show for years. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as they have, folks. Uh, it's you... about bloody time! Thank you, announcer man. Wow, he has been silent through this dang thing. But, you know, I can smell the pipe. <laughs> That's another thing that we talked about. It. What episode was it? The the Voyage of the Van Leeuwen? Leeuwen, no? Leeuwen Hook. That's already aired, right? Yes. Yes, that should have been the episode right before this, probably. Okay. Something in the author's note of the Van Leeuwen Hook episode, he talked about the stories that he's written that he likes the most, nobody responds to. And the ones that he considers just tossing away as, as rubbish are the ones that people want to buy. And so maybe it's not just me. Maybe everybody has that that problem of being too close or too attached or too subjective to their own creations, their own art. It's funny, though, that I don't know if a story is genuinely good. And I wrote one recently, and you're like, wow, that, that was shit. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then you're like, nothing. I can't remember what you said. You, you said, oh, I, 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 you got to send that out to somebody. That's really, really good. And I was like, wow, thanks. And of course, Never thought about sending it again because it's me, but... I'm going to come up with a new strategy. I said, don't send that one out. Just give me the final copy of it, okay? And then I'll just send it out unbeknownst to you and I'll put my name on it. And, and you know, I really need to learn to do that because... Oh, you mean put your name on other people's stories? Oh, I do that all the time. Because, <laughs> you know, like next week's Strange Affair of the Sundered Man by Rich Outfield, that's going to be a really good episode, yeah. I think. People will really be proud of me. No, uh, what I, I do is I overthink these submission things. You know, there are people out there, Nathaniel Lee, who send their work out <laughs> all the time. They're, they're so good at it, at sending their work out that they don't even think about it. But me, I'll look at a venue, a Abyss and Apex. And two weeks later, I'm still trying to think of a story that would fit for them or what they might like or, or, or what is an Abyss and Apex story exactly and, and which of my stories most looks like that. Whereas anybody else would just be like, no, I send it to them. If they take it, then it's an Abyss and Apex story. And if they don't take it, then it's a story for Fantasy Magazine, you know? Yeah. So abyss and Apex is hard because, you know, an Abyss is like way down at the bottom and an Apex is all the way up at the top. And so which is it? Hard to figure what they're actually after. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. And from what I've always been told as far as submitting stuff is, is you just need to make up a spreadsheet that has the names of every single magazine that could possibly take it. And then you just go down the line, you send it to the first one. And when they say no, you put an X, I sent it here. Then you go to the next one and you go to the next one and you just keep going until you find that one because you never know. And I, I totally understand that because we've been editors of our own show now for all this time and we don't know what we want. 
really? We can say, oh yeah, I, I would really dig on some space opera or something. I want more fairy stories about the police. Yeah, well, how come we haven't gotten any of those? How many times have we asked for that? And still, no fairy stories about the police. Someday we got to get that quote and stick it in there. <laughs> sure, we could do that. You don't really know what it is that you want, but when the story comes in your hand and you take a look at it and you're like, this is a good story. And as you're reading through, you're just like, oh, unless something goes seriously wrong with this story, I'm taking it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you don't know that you want a story about a woman who can transfer cancer and pregnancies into dogs until you read that story and you're like, wow, this is really good. This is this is sick as hell. I want this story, you know, and you don't know until it comes. So you just got to blanket the place. Just send it from one to the next to the next until find that one that's actually after it. If you have figured out how to do this, please <laughs> tell, tell me how. how. Tell me. You know, that, that goes hand in hand. I mentioned a little while ago our broken mirror story event. You know, we should be doing one of those by now. It's weird that we haven't. That's something that you and I both really enjoy is putting down a premise and running with it and seeing how you can go or where you might take it or where somebody else might take it. That's fun. That's an interesting aspect of human creativity, of people being different. And so, you know, there's possible somebody out there could write a really funny story about a woman that can pass disease on to animals possible you never know i thought you were going to say it's possible <laughs> scott pig <laughs> but you didn't thank goodness anyhow I, I i guess i'm rambling the rambling thank you because <laughs> <laughs> love the look of his face as announcer man mentions that Good that he's always on the ball with his comments, though, huh? He always waits until we already mention that we're rambling. Then he tells us, hey, you're <laughs> rambling. Oh, thanks, uh, Answer Man, for being on the ball. Oh, wait, OT is the only intelligent one here. Well, then I guess maybe we should let people go. I, I, I don't know. Do you have more to say? I, I, what the hell is a whelp? A <laughs> whelp is, a, is a, like a dog, a, a puppy. So it was a huge surprise to me where the story went, because that word means nothing to me. <laughs> All right. Maybe we should have... Hey, R-O-A-D-O-T, he hasn't said much this week. Can you edit out uh, my admission of not knowing what whelp means? If you think it will help this episode inch its way toward perfection, that is my goal in life. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Perfection. Boy, that's something the show will never achieve, huh? Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, we don't really have much more to say. Before we go, we would like to say please donate to the show if you have the means to do so, because we pay our authors. We paid uh, Damon for today's story, and uh, we'd like to be able to pay more. So the more that we get on donations, the more we can pay to our authors and make them actually receive the money that their effort was worth. Yes, with the money we gave Damon... And an extra two pounds, he could get a bottle of water. That's right. So please donate uh, if, if you can. We would really appreciate it. And we have that one incentive episode, if you haven't heard that, where Rish uh, does his story. You can get your hands on that, too, with a donation. Oh, we haven't got the new incentive episode up yet? Probably not. I don't know. All right. I started editing on it, but I doubt it'll be ready. Well, it's coming. And you know what? If Folks, if you can't donate, please tell somebody about the show or say something in the comments or give us a nice review on iTunes. Or hand out one of our flyers. Ah, the flyer's still there. You could do that. That's right. The flyer. Is there a link to the flyer or is it just... There's a link to it on the uh, episode 100. Ah. You can download the PDF of the flyer and print out as many as you'd like to hand out to all your friends, relatives, strangers on the street, anyone. Kill a few trees. Yes. They're dead anyways. I mean, they've already been made into paper. You're just going to print. Okay. Well, kill a few ink squids. <laughs> uh, I think we will start work on next week's episode now. What do you say? All right. Sounds like a good idea. All right, well, thank you for listening all the way to the end of the show. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Good night. See ya. Looks like we're out of time. 
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. I'm the ever-competent announcer man. Take two. Low groaned from behind him, and turning, saw the dog, hind legs open wide. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, oh, Scott has to make a sound effect for this. That's awesome. No, no, no. Not this, the, the dog. The burst of rosy liquid he has to make. <laughs> That's just repugnant, man. And then burst with a gush of rosy liquid over the back of his car. He... F- <laughs> That's just gross, man. <laughs> See what it could leave a little Never again. And it was produced by. Wait, well, let me read the Scott show stuff. Pig. Scott James Pig. That's what he said in his little intro thingy there. Welp. How the fudge do you say welp? Welp. Welp. By Damon. Okay. All right, here we go. Welp. Probably don't have to quite. It just doesn't sound right when I say. You don't have to quite pop the P as much, I don't think. Oh, if I can't get through the title, uh, I'm afraid Scott is screwed. Yeah, he's in for a long t- night of editing. As he'll be at it for an hour, and it's like, okay, we made it through the title. First paragraph, please, please. Guest producer Scott Pig found dead at his own hand. Feeling the tarmac changed to shifting gravel under his. Misspelled. It's his tires with a Y. His T rays. <laughs> she reached into the envelope and pulled out a glossy ten by eight photograph, which is very different, I suppose, from an eight by ten. Which <laughs> this every- is British. The tire is spelled with a Y. What do you want? He asked, though he feared he already knew. Let did you make that. a noise? I did. Let me do it a little differently. Hungry. Hungry. Mentioning. You're hungry or do it hungrily? No, I'm hungry. Oh, what do they oh, what do they show? I'm, I, no, you did that very constipated. <laughs> oh darn. I was it was my stomach grumbling. Come on, I was grabbing my belly, not my buttocks. Yes, <laughs> to say smelt and odour in the same sentence. Should I be should I be uh, Doing liming this up? <laughs> The, the air smelt of new paint and floral disinfectant. No. Masking a dark odor underneath. Mosque and crying. Mm, yes. I'll be sure to put big pauses. That was where he wants to intersperse the sex scenes. That's where I gotta do the. Oh, yes, baby. Oh, who's your daddy? Call, Come on. Call, call me, me Captain. Jeremy. <laughs> oh, that's good. I had the same thought there. Is that okay? You need to say premiere. Right. He's got the little... Oh. We are seeing a premiere of his latest opera. Thanks for listening. Now, TiVo premiere. I never miss a football game at all when I've got TiVo premiere. And he's from Oklahoma. Yeah, it's weird. Huh? He took the offered canopy. He- this is a high society thing that we wouldn't understand. No, that's right. It's a sex thing you wouldn't understand. <laughs> Too loud, you think? What the hell is she doing in there? She's grouting the tile. She's burying one of your neighbors underneath the tiles. <laughs> and the floorboards. Tell. Ivan watched her talk. Faint spot. She's, she's, of bricking, she's bricking that really annoying guy up with the Amontillado. <laughs> For the love of God, Montressor. <laughs> yes. For the love of God. She spoke most... Mo money, mo money. The whitest guy I know, and you say mo money. Anyway, I get them from rescue centres now. Jim is still a very sick man. And this is a sick story. With all these friggin' Britishisms. <laughs> not the animal mutilation. That's not so bad. It's spelling center wrong. Yeah, That's yeah. when they spell center and add these U's into... Oh, and extra L's. Did you notice that in counseling had two L's in it? Is that correct, you think, I can't in British? I spell counseling anyway, so I always put extra L's in and yeah. a, a W sometimes. I know- 
Up next, White Wedding by Billy Idol on the star. Step by step, he finally reached his waiting room door. All those hours on the thigh master did me no good at all. Let's hear what that would sound like, sir. <laughs> we'll get to that later. I'll do it right now. The thigh master part, you know, the... <clears throat> <laughs> we'll do the sound effects for going okay. up the stairs and breathing we're through deep and going up the stairs. Do I need to say long again? Well, the story is effed up. Dude. <laughs> it is. I think that's the reason we picked it is because it was so effed up. We're like, yeah, you can't turn this down. Of course, you probably won't hear that on the recording. No, because it'll be too much breathing and screaming and running and right. screaming. Dang. By the way, uh, when you get Julie's sex sound, send them my way. Yes, <laughs> by way of me. I don't think I did enough cursing and wailing for running the room. Too. I think you did. You, you, you did some yelling yeah. and screaming. Running. Yelling and the screaming and the white buttocks flailing. Back twisted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you could just see the look on Rish's face. Ah, why did do nothing? <laughs> the pained look on Rish's face. Oh, oh. Her name Eloise. Oh, oh, Eloise. Oh, Wheezy. Oh, Wheezy. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, Wheezy Jefferson. Oh, oh Sherman Hemsley. Oh. oh, that big white guy with the mustache. Oh, call me Mr. J. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, <laughs> I gotta do 10 seconds of flirty giggling.